So welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to MUIH. If you are not a student or staff or faculty <coughs> member here, welcome. We had 125 people sign up. In fact, today I turned a few people away, so I guess the rain is having an impact. Um, so maybe some of you can move up, if you don't mind. We promise not to call on you if you don't want to be called on. Um, I know some of you are going to leave early, so that's fine. But those of you that are comfortable moving forward, it would be great to have you move forward. So welcome. It's so great that we had so many people interested in this topic on health disparities. We will be videotaping it so those who were not able to make it will get a chance to hear the talk. Um, I'm Cheryl Shapiro. I am the Associate Vice President of Values, Diversity, and Inclusion here at MUIH. And um, it's heartening, again, that so many people are interested in this topic. And here at MUIH, we are deeply committed to being a part of the solution of addressing this complex problem. So we ask you, and we are excited to have you join us in that quest, because indeed it is a complex problem. One of my favorite quotes, and one that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is from Margaret Mead. And she says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So we may be a small group here today, but my hope is that after this talk tonight, you'll go back home, back to your communities, back to your friends and family, and share with them. Share with them what you've learned, because I do truly believe that it's person by person that we can make a difference. So that's my invitation to you. Before I introduce you to our speaker, we have some evaluation forms that are on your chairs. I would ask you just to take a minute or two at the end to please fill it out. It'll help us to um, for the programming. So, we are thrilled to have Dr. Chuchu Saunders here as our guest speaker. Dr. Saunders is a mother, a pediatrician, and formal medical epidemiologist with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where for over 10 years she was involved with issues related to children's health and youth violence prevention. She was also a program officer at the Ford Foundation, senior deputy director of health in Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia's De deputy health commissioner. She served as senior deployment operations manager for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration and the Katrina Assistance Pro Pro Project. Dr. Saunders is currently a public health consultant and author of various journal articles, as well as a children's book for girls entitled, Oops. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Saunders. Great, well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm a strong believer that who is supposed to be here is here. <laughs> and it was really interesting that she started the conversation by quoting Margaret Mead. I truly believe that if you're in this room tonight, you're a change agent and something's going to happen as a result of what I'm going to say to you because I'm going to challenge you. Um, before I get started, how many of you are students? Let me just see where the students are. Okay. Faculty? Staff? Okay. Um, Practitioners in the community, right. and just <laughs> all right, we'll take that. All right, well, welcome. Whatever path you have chosen to come here, I welcome you, and I hope that we will stimulate each other, because I believe that wherever I go and I speak, I learn as well, and it just helps me move on and 
just keep continuing to give what it is I think I'm supposed to give. And so I'm expecting you to give me something as well because I need my light to shine when I leave here. Okay? So we got an agreement. So we're supposed to be here together for two hours. That's not going to happen. All right? I'm not going to keep you all here for two hours. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking in my head now I'm going to change some things up. And we're just going to do it really, really an extemporaneous. I'm going to try to draw you in, ask you questions, you ask me questions, and we'll just try to make it work. Okay? Is that okay with everybody? Yes. Everybody agree? That's the way it's going to happen. All right. Let me just say this. There are two papers that I specifically wrote that I think is important for you to have. I'm going to ask Dr. Shapiro to get those to you or have them out somewhere so that you can have them because I'm going to reference those papers that I wrote. And the reason I'm referencing them is because I have begun to accept who I am. That's hard. I do believe, though, that many of you in this room, especially if you are a natural care practitioner, you delve into natural therapies, you are beginning to accept who you are. And the reason I say that is because you can't do what you do well if you don't accept who you are. All right? So I'm beginning to accept who I am. And why I know that is because 2005, I wrote an article, it was not published in 2006, about complementary or integrative medicine and therapies and the practitioners that need to evolve. 2005 now, we're in 2018. And in 2015, I had another experience that I'm going to tell you about, and it was about health disparities, actually. So it was really fortuitous when she asked me to speak, and she put those two things together, which was significant for me because there were two articles that I had written, and I kind of wrote them, and they just kind of went into the ether. You know, they just kind of went out there, and you don't know what's happening. And then afterwards, now, in 2018, they come together. So it's really, this is significant for me. So I really am expecting you all to challenge me on what, I, what I'm going to tell you, okay? So let's start. Uh, this is my clicker, right? So let me start first by saying this. In 2015, the Centers for Disease Control held a special meeting. Uh, it was actually um, organized by Tuskegee University's um, National Bioethics Center. And it was because it was the 100th anniversary that you know. Hi, yes. Yeah, like of Booker T. Washington's death. And I was asked to come and give a speech. And my speech was on what did the data say? What does the data mean? And what happened was that it was really significant because of April 2015 was exactly a hundred years to the date when Booker T. Washington had talked about Negro health. Negro, he declared Negro Health Week, which became significantly Public Health Week. Right? She's shaking her head. That's good. I have somebody in the room who can really challenge me. <laughs> so it was very interesting when I was asked to give that talk because I thought 100 years after Booker T. Washington has said that the health of people of color, specifically black people, Negroes as he called them, was poor, significantly poor. And here it was, 2015, 100 years later, and it was exactly the same. And I'm an epidemiologist, so I looked at the numbers and the statistics and saw that it was, my gosh, nothing has really, really changed. It's amazing. As a matter of fact, I keep, my, I'm getting older now, so I have to look these things up. It was in 2000. In um, 1985, the Secretary's Task Force put out a, 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 it was called the Heckler's Report, looked at excess deaths that occurred amongst African Americans. And then in 2005, which was approximately 90 years after Booker T. Washington had declared public health week because blacks were significantly impacted by health issues, um, Satcher, and the, Satcher, Dr. David Satcher, wrote mm -hmm. another who was the, the um, uh, Secretary of Health. Well, no, he was the Surgeon General at that time. He was the Surgeon General, not Secretary General. Wrote an article as well talking about excess deaths that occurred amongst people of color. So here I was asked to give a speech in 2015, 10 years later, about it. So I'm going to walk you through health disparities a little because a lot of people think they know what they are, and some do and some don't, and I'm just going to make sure that we're on the same page and then we're going to discuss some things about it. So first of all, health disparity. What is a health disparity? A health 
Disparity is a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. All right? This health disparity adversely affects groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on their racial or ethnic group, their religion, their socioeconomic status, their gender, their age, their mental health, their cognitive, sensory, or physical disability, their sexual orientation or gender identity, their geographic location, or other characteristics historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. But most of us, when we think of a health disparity, we think only about the racial contact. We don't even remember all of these other contexts that it can be placed in. So I want you to understand that that is significant. Because who knows, in this room, there might be somebody here who's going to change how the data actually looks. And it may be a different aspect of it that you look at completely. Health equity, on the other hand, or other basis, is actually the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. All right? So a disparity is usually what we use to measure whether or not we are attaining health equity, which is what we call the highest level of health for everybody. It requires valuing everyone equally, okay? And it also gives special attention to the needs of those at greatest risk, those who traditionally are suffering from poor health, and it's based on social conditions, right? So health equity and health disparity. They're both based on principles of ethics and human rights, actually. So the resources needed to be healthy, including not only medical care, according to Daniels, but also health-promoting living and working conditions, should not be treated as commodities, such as designer clothing or luxury cars, he says. They should be distributed according to need. Greater equity is achieved by selectively improving the health of those who are economically and socially disadvantaged. So how do we measure health disparities? Well, health disparities are traditionally indicate the gap in US health. It's always, we're the ones who do this. I don't think there are any other, I don't know of any other country or nationality that look at health disparities the way we do. It's usually within the context of morbidity and mortality, and it's defined by race and ethnicity or sex, education, income, geographic location, and disability status, as I said before. So for the sake of our group, we're going to do health disparities. We're going to compare blacks or African Americans or non-Hispanic blacks, which is the term they use for data now, all right, which is always confusing to a lot of people, <coughs> versus whites, Caucasians, or non-Hispanic whites. That's what the, that's the health, that's what the, the, the groups that we're going to compare in this whole conversation about health disparities. So, there is a question. This is the question I want you to keep in mind, because I'm going to ask it again. But should the rate of health outcomes in a group that is disproportionately affected be compared with the rate in the general population, which is usually the majority population, in our case, whites, or the population with the lowest rate of health outcomes? That's the question. Keep that in mind as we move forward. Because that's what we're doing, right? I said we're comparing blacks to whites. And blacks are traditionally considered to be adversely impacted by social determinants of health. Whites, not as much, maybe little, but not much. And if it is, it's by class or socioeconomic status. For blacks, there's a plethora of reasons. And mostly, it's race. Yeah. All right? So what I'm asking you is, should the rate of health outcome in that group, <coughs> which is already disproportionately affected, be always compared to what we consider to be the better group? Hold that question. All right? So let's look at some racial and ethnic differences. This is infant mortality. <coughs> so what we see here, and I'm gonna go through this, I'm gonna go through these quick so we can get out of here. Uh, you all can be on time. The longer 
bar, which is 13.5, is the infant mortality rate for African Americans compared to the whites, which is the bar closest to it over here. All right? Can everybody see that? All right. And then the other is the U.S. infant mortality rate, which vary greatly by race and ethnicity. And the total is the one that's green, but the longest is the non-Hispanic black. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see that. So comparing blacks to whites, blacks have higher infant mortality rates than whites. And it's significant because, you know, an infant mortality rate is an indication of how well a country is doing. So those countries that have high infant mortality rates are environments that are not doing as well. Oh, this, this, this. All right, this is also infant mortality rates over time. And what you need to just focus on is the gap. You see, the blacks are in yellow and the whites are the blue and all races is in the middle. But you can see over time, there's a gap. The gap is lessened a little bit, but it's over time, it continues. And even though this data stops in um, 2005, it still <coughs> continues to be a gap. Is that 1935? 1935, yep. Yeah. The first one, 1935? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so that's infant mortality. This is the difference in age-adjusted mortality rates of whites and African Americans. And these are the number of potential um, lives that can be saved if the rates have been comparable. <laughs> All right? So what you want to look at is that first, that top row, which are African American males. <laughs> Where do you think uh, white males are? Can you see them? They're the same one, they're below. <coughs> the triangle. But you see how higher the black male is than the white male? Can you see that? The second one, <coughs> which are triangles. Empty triangles. White males, yeah, they're empty. And then the circles which are filled in are African American, and then the empty circles are white. Gap still continues to exist. I, I forgot that we circled them. Okay, this is heart disease death rates right. from 1950 to 2001. <coughs> and I can assure you that even if I took it all the way out, the same gaps will be there. The African American males are the blue boxes. Actually, white males had a higher rate and then it crossed back in 19, about 1975. You can see it cross, and now African American males have the highest, and African American females have rates higher. They're the purple boxes versus the red triangles for white females. But you see the gap. The gap still consists. Yes? Is, is there something of note that explains why there was a switch around 1975? What was it that happened in, the, in our culture, in our, in our nation? What do you think it could be? 1975. I always believe that when a person answers, asks a question, they always yeah, you know, they have the answer. answer. I don't have an answer, but you do. in 75, that, that was when the whole wheat fat thing started. That could be it. That's true. Heart disease, that's, that's a good observation. I was thinking more about stress and how yeah. we lived our lives and riots and all of that stuff was going on, the civil rights movement, things yeah. like that. But that's excellent. That's an excellent answer. I bet if you trace it back to food, I bet it's significant. Okay? The tobacco campaign really started to get That's another thing, too. That's, that's exactly that. right. Yeah, that's tobacco. All those commercials that are geared to oh. These are heart disease, cancer, and stro uh, stroke. Yeah by racial groups, and you can see for heart disease, which is in red, the highest is amongst African Americans. For cancer, who has the highest bar? African Americans. And for stroke, African Americans. All right? So even for these specific diseases, the gap still remains. Something called expected years free of activity limitation caused by chronic conditions. It's a little weird uh, uh, <laughs> marker that we look at in, in, for chronic diseases. It's, it's how much, how limited you will become as a result of the chronic disease that 
that you're suffering from. And as you can see again, it gaps. And then the, the one on the other side just shows you oh, the differences. When they, did, when they took out the differences, they, they plotted that and it goes up and down. But basically what I want you to focus on is the gap. And this is the newest disease process that we talk about now, which is HIV and AIDS. I don't have to tell all of you how significant that is, how much of a burden African Americans are suffering as a result of it. It's one of the leading causes of death for young African American heterosexual, and very much a leading cause for men who have sex with men, uh, African Americans specifically. But this one looks at uh, um, Amer African Americans compared to other nations, and we, we show up. You can see we're like the fifth bar over. Small, it's not as large as South Africa, but the fact is that you can compare our rates with other countries, and African Americans are a group within a country. <coughs> This is, this is the same thing again. I just put that in to show that um, if you look at the rate and the prevalence of HIV in the United States, you know for blacks it's higher, but it's even higher for individual states like in Georgia. And that's where the CDC is. <laughs> put that in for a little irony. It's ironic, right? Really. <laughs> of course it is. That's where, the, that's where, the, uh, that's yeah. where Social Security is. So yeah. It makes perfect sense. And these are rates of potential preventable hospitalizations among adults greater than 18 years by race and ethnicity over time. And again, the top row is African American males, right? Followed by Hispanics, actually, which we're not going to focus on in. And then the top solid line is for um, African American non-Hispanic uh, whites. And then the one at the bottom is for Asian and Pacific Islanders. I didn't put my glasses on so I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And it's really significant because what, what they found that is if we had rates as low as Asian and Pacific um, Islanders as it related to hospitalizations, we would be saving billions of dollars in this country. Why do you think that Asian and Pacific Islanders have lower hospitalization rates? There's a couple. What? Come on, what are you all here for? Diet. Well, it's a diet. Diet's one. What else do you think? Quality of life and, and stress. Life and stress. What else? Yeah. And they also use a lot of herbs. Yeah, sense also. of a community. That's a good one. What else? Self-care. Therapies. Yeah, self-care. Right. Therapy. It's herbs. Of course. Of course. Chinese medicine, whatever it may be. <laughs> they delve in it probably more than definitely African Americans and um, Latinos do. They have their own, but not as much. Sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, it's the same thing. It's the same thing, but looking at it in the bar graph. So in 19, um, uh, no, 2006, David Satcher, okay, Probably got that wrong. No. Yeah, right? That was right. Yeah. Wrote this paper that if we were equal, a comparison of the black white mortality rate, comparing 1960s to the 2000s. And what they found was that basically there are 83,000 excess deaths per year among African Americans. If we could close that gap, we would eliminate 83,000 excess deaths among people of color. In this case, if not, it's mostly African Americans. That's significant. Extremely significant. <coughs> Extremely significant. And this, again, is looking at the same information, but this is for females. All right? So I'm not going to bother you with that, but it's the same type of information. So in summary, Disparities in mortality and morbidity between segments of the U.S. population have been well documented. So we know this for over time. Am I correct? Does everybody agree with me? Because yes. I showed you a lot of data over time, back even to the 30s. Right? We have known this. And you know, as epidemiologists, we're very good at collecting data. What we're not that good at, or what we don't do as well, is come up with a solution for that. 
and that's why I'm here tonight. So African Americans have the highest infant mortality rate, excess death rate, and shortest number of years expected to live without activity limitations. African Americans continue to suffer excess deaths each year from what we consider to be preventable or curable diseases. <coughs> in the United States of America, which is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, I believe that that is just embarrassing. <laughs> she used the word embarrassing. embarrassing. I, I just think it's, we, that something must be done. And the, you can't do anything if you keep thinking the same way, right? So health disparities and health equity are very much intertwined, right? Health disparities, as I said, are the metric we use to measure the progress to, towards achieving health equity. Health equity means social justice in health. Okay, no one is denied the possibility to be healthy for belonging to a group that has historically been economically or socially disadvantaged. Do you want me to read that again? <laughs> <laughs> no one should be denied the possibility to be healthy for belonging to a group that has historically been economically and socially disadvantaged. But they are, aren't they? So that key question I ask you, should the rate of health outcomes in a group that is disproportionately affected be compared with the rate in the general population? Or the population with the lowest rate of health outcomes? Don't answer it, just think about it again. Let me see what I have next. And the reason I'm asking this question is because when I stood up in front of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, I propose that we begin to collect diff data in a different way. That it's not making any sense, nothing is changing, we just keep reporting on this gap that just keeps going. We already know the factors that contributed to it. We've put out interventions, but something's not right. Something's not working. And I propose that there needs to be a new discussion about optimal health. Do you all know what optimal health is? Yes. What is optimal health? She said yes. What do you think? Yes. yes. Either one of you. Yes, go ahead, define it. Well, what about ultimate health? Uh, health that is um, attainable mm -hmm. and sustain self-sustainable. Uh -huh. It would exclude things like lifetime prescriptions. Uh -huh. um, that's not Go ahead. That's good. What were you going to say? Anything different? Were you going to say anything different? about having access to an opportunity to have good health, period. And I think a good place to start might be to look at countries where they have universal health care and see what they're doing that is working and not working and go from there. Because at this point, it seems like we can have as many therapies out there as we want, but if black people can't access them because they don't have money, okay. then they might as well not have them. Yeah. All right, very good. All right, so I'm going to challenge both of you on what you said, but let me say this first. The definition of optimal health was defined by an African-American physician named Dr. John Chiselle. Have you all heard of him? You, he, was, he lived right here in Baltimore, actually. And he said, optimal health is the best possible emotional, intellectual, physical, spiritual, and socioeconomic aliveness that one can attain. It is a continuous process or journey rather than a destination or an end point. It was defined by an African American physician. I propose that African Americans or any group should be compared to a group that has optimal health. It is not the Caucasian race. It can't be. They have their own problems as well. They suffer from diseases as well. So why are we being held as a standard to their health versus a standard of optimal health? 
which it has a definition, mm -hmm. but not too many people know what it is. But my theory is people who delve in natural therapies, they know what it is. And you know why they know what it is? Because it is that airy fairy thing that people talk about. It is not subscribed. It is not something you can find out by subjecting someone to a randomized clinical trial. <laughs> And placebos or no placebos. <laughs> it is not always evidence-based. It is not always scientific. It is believing in your patient. It's empathetic listening. It's narrative. It's seeing them. It's telling them and letting them know that you care. That's how you get to that. And there aren't that many people in this country who are healers that do that unless they are delving with of natural therapies. I told the CDC that back in 2015. Even more importantly, I told a group about that back in 2005. That's why I'm here today. I can't believe it. It's like, you all are the answer for me. When I proposed it, I didn't know who was going to collect what I considered to be this new type of of, of data. African Proverbs says to know and not do is to not know. <clears throat> All right? So now we know. And I'm calling for a paradigm shift in healing communities of color. And the people that I believe that can do that are people who believe and delve in natural therapies. You have the answer. I know. I don't know what it is but I know that you have the answer. And it's not just the answer for local, regional, national, but global health. I'm employing on you, I'm calling on you to think bigger than you've ever thought before. But more importantly, contribute to a new data set that defines what optimal health is because conventional medicine does not know what it is. They think they do. All they do is suppress, eliminate, cut, whatever, right? But they don't do what you all do. They don't respect the body. They don't allow the natural process to evolve. They don't think time is important. They don't listen empathetically. They're always talking to their patients. They don't tell their patients or make them feel that they even care. You guys do that up front. You practitioners have all the skills. Just do it. Just do it. You can do this. Natural therapies, I believe, are the hope for healing globally. I showed you a gap that exists in the United States with blacks and whites. You know what's happening around the globe. Everybody is ill. Everybody is ill. I'm telling you. Get on it. Without you, and those therapies, the gaps will become wider because of all of that, what's happening with the environment and all of the other changes that we're all trying to stress and financial uh, 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 upheaval and political upheaval, whatever it may be, the gaps will continue to widen. The work must be done together. No one entity, no one therapy can do it alone. It's the combination of all of them. I can't emphasize that more. Because sometimes people who do natural therapies think theirs is the best and will advocate for that. It's not true. It takes a village. It's all of it. it takes a village. She said the concept of it takes a village. Did you, did you, can I just add, can I just add something? Yeah. Um, I wanted to add to the definition of optimum health as, as I think about it and something that we, we teach here. Um, we've taught that it's not um, necessarily the absence of, of symptoms, yeah. but it's a sense of well-being. Yeah. So I think that that's an important factor uh -huh. into it. And then the other, you alluded to it, is this notion of helping the client or patient understand their <coughs> own wisdom, the wisdom of their own bodies. Right. And that's scary, especially for a client who comes with a disease process that they have been told that could potentially kill them, and you all say, your body will heal each other. No, 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 you've got to give me something. Yes? I didn't want to 
once again for an hour while we were breaking their bit. I, he said uh, the doctors have been really talking to patients. I don't think they've been talking to patients. They talk at patients. Okay. That, well, I meant um, to, to be at. Yeah. Yeah. They, they yeah. talk at patients. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's slowly evolving, very slowly, but I mean, we all know it's been beaten to death that healthcare trying to turn it around has been trying to try to bring up the Titanic and then make sure the Titanic avoids uh, hitting that iceberg. But I mean, it, it's it's happening over time, but it's the it's just understanding the entire person. I not getting too far into it, but um, I I know we all had different experiences. But most recently, I had experience with my dad before he, before he passed it. Uh, before I moved back home when he had his first stroke, it was so frustrating. One, because I work in healthcare, and then also, of course, because he's my dad, so of course I'm even more frustrated than just how siloed all the different entities are. Um, and he, he, of course, is just caught in the middle. He doesn't know what's what's going on, and they're not. They're like, let me take care of your arm. Okay, this other person, they'll take care of your eye. They'll take care of your brain. They'll take care of your foot. And then, and in the end, the person ends up falling apart. That's exactly right. How many of you raise your hand if you've had that experience? Many of us, right? And as a matter of fact, if you're not, you have to become an advocate. If you do anything in healthcare. You become the advocate for any other member in your family that becomes ill. Have you notice that? And if you're not there as an advocate, they're not treated right. No matter where they go, <coughs> you know, the top-notch hospital. Hospital deaths, the lead, one of the leading causes of deaths in this country. I didn't bring that statistic, but we know that. <coughs> hospital deaths. So in conclusion, we all must grow toward